Hola, buenas tardes y bienvenidos. Good afternoon. Welcome to our symposium. I'm the CEO of the Oral Health Foundation. Uh, we're a UK-based but globally working charity that works with the public to promote uh, oral health. The symposium that we're here to present today, and we've got three excellent speakers for you, uh, is on a project that we've been doing with GSK on the care of dentures. It's become very clear that recommendations for denture care are very patchy, um, patients are confused, dentists are confused as to what they should be uh, recommending. So we've uh, produced a paper which our second speaker, uh, Dr. Guy Goffin, is going to be talking about on producing some expert agreed guidelines for denture care. Um, finally, you're going to hear from Professor Bartlett from uh, King's College London on not only denture care but the well-being of the patient and the quality of life of the patient with dentists with dentures and what we can do to improve this. But our first speaker today will be uh, well known to you all I'm sure. He's Professor Frizia from both University of Buenos Aires and Maimonides University, specialist in uh, prosthodontists, and I'll hand over to Professor Frizia. Good morning. I don't know whether you can hear me well. Well, I would first like to thank GSK for having uh, called upon me to participate, for having invited me to participate at the symposium together with Drs. Bartlett and Goffin. I also would like to thank the, for you for being here. Many of you I know are from abroad, so I wish you a good stay here in Buenos Aires. And also, I'd like to congratulate the organizing committee for this prestigious event as the F this is the FDI World Congress. In these 20 minutes, what I am going to try to report are some considerations about denture users, wearers, uh, removable total and partial dentures. With regard to this type of prosthetic rehabilitation, it is necessary to make a few comments, taking into account that although there have been uh, advances in dentistry in the last few years and already well into the 21st century, we still use these uh, removable partial dentures, uh, I mean, total or dental. No, partial dentures, we are continuing to be used not only because of patient desires, but also uh, out of need or out of necessity. Talking about edentialism, we can say that the cause of edentialism cannot be strictly linked to age, patient age, but there are also conditions such as ectodermal dysplasia, which leads to the loss of teeth and also in young people who conditions such as multiple carriers which lead to uh, early loss of teeth. So we could say that edentialism is not a direct consequence of aging, but that it takes place at all ages. Obviously, there is a greater incidence in older adults. It is also important not to overlook the social and economic uh, reality of, uh, in the region where many times the solution in the case of tooth pain is simple extraction. This has already been reported by Jorgensen in 1999 in his book where he describes uh, this phrase. It says that eventualism will never disappear. Obviously, all dentists wish this not to happen, but statistics show that we would have to work a lot to reverse this trend. 
with regard to world uh, projections, worldwide projections, Jorgensen already described uh, regarding to aging, this, this uh, predominant factor that in 2025, 20% 20 of the world population was going to be older than 65 years of age. And this is, goes hand in hand with tooth loss. Let us uh, relate this. And the World Health Organization described in its website some considerations about aging and says that between 2000 and 2050, the uh, percentage of patients on the planet that will be of inhabitants, planet inhabitants over 60 years will be doubled from 11% to 22%. And in absolute figures, will go from 605 million inhabitants to 2,000 a million inhabitants over half a century. So this leads us to infer that this type of prosthetic rehabilitation uh, with dentures will continue to be uh, performed even against our wishes, our best wishes. There is an organization in Latin America, uh, Latin American group uh, on odontogenerontology who are concerned about the situation and have worked out some statistics that are in very interesting in spite of the fact that many times dentists uh, do not like uh, statistical data and would like the new technologies and the techniques. It is necessary to highlight these statistics because they will reveal the tendencies that will uh, take place in future years. It says that the percentage population over 65, we're speaking of Latin America, will increase from 10%, representing 10% 10 in 2010, and it will go to 25% in 2050. And we see that there will be growth in a very short time. There will be an enormous growth, and that this will need to be uh, contemplated by society and by the profession to see in which way uh, we establish treatment for this type of patients. These statistics, if we um, turn them into figures, we know that uh, I, from 59 million inhabitants in 2010, we, in 2050, there will be 196 million patients over 60. And this is an interesting piece of information, which is talking about uh, adults older than 80. Uh, the aging of aging, as it is called. So it's uh, there is, will be a number of patients that will go be over 80. And in 2010, was 8,600, 8,006 inhabitants. We're going to become, uh, go up to 44 million inhabitants. That's what I said before. The profession is going to have to uh, adjust to care for these needs that are, will not just be dental needs. According to edentialism in the region, we have not found uh, lots of statistics, but this group, uh, in this study published in 2018 in gerontology, there are some references which, if you see, since 2010, 2014, we get the references. And this refers to edentialism patients older than 65 with edentulism percentages. In Panama, 45% of uh, edentulous patients over 65. Brazil, 53.7%. Chile, 11.4%. Uruguay, 28.2%. And Colombia, 32.9%. In Argentina, we do not have statistics uh, for uh, edentulous patients older than 65, but we can establish a relationship due to neighbors, you know, neighboring um, or closeness to our Uruguayan uh, friends, and we would be very close to the Uruguayan values. 
As you know, I am a professor at the University of Buenos Aires. It's a department where we see partially edentulous patients and fully edentulous patients. I'm going to give you some statistics, and internal statistics of our own department, where, which might be relevant and we could draw some conclusions from them. So, in 2016, we saw during the year, yeah, sorry, can you hear me? We saw 750 patients during the uh, academic year. And please look at the statistics. The average age uh, uh, matches uh, the older adult uh, group with, uh, where more teeth are lost. And a relevant piece of information is that we see more women than men. But the most important piece of information is that the first half of 2018, we have already seen for the first time the same number of patients that we discharged in 2016. Here we can infer that the cause um, for which we uh, see more patients at the moment is maybe due to several reasons. One, to the improvements that the dental school has made in the last 10 years. The position of the University of Buenos Aires in society, where it provides care according to society needs. And also because it uh, charges fees that are within uh, the means and the income of these patients. So we, our expectation is that over this year, we are going to exceed 800 patients with these characteristics. So we see that there is a requirement or demand from the population and a need for these uh, cases to be solved with removable rehabilitations. In majority of rehabilitations, prosthetic solutions go through the following stages. We see that totally aden fully edentulous patient, a patient who has lost their reference uh, anatomical references due to wear and patients with implants and curiously enough they all end up with a removable prosthesis which indicate which points to the need and the tendency towards a removable prosthesis or denture uh, to the fact that it will continue to exist over time. I think that with our work group in Buenos Aires University and Maimonides University, we have the idea of reversing a patient trends and also students' trends because, in general, we receive patients in these conditions without any oral health maintenance or preventive checkups. A patient arrives to us when they have exhausted all other possibilities. We rehabilitate the patient, and then the patient comes back, or rather leaves our office without <coughs> preventive uh, control. So uh, the proposal I'm going to make is to uh, do a prevention after the denture. And the same uh, problem, uh, the same approach is that of the rehabilitated patient. After 10 years, they come back to the office because they have deteriorated and because the remaining teeth is uh, have uh, decayed more. So what failed here is prevention and maintenance. So we can say that there are two main requirements or basic requirements to rehab this type of patient. So firstly, that the operator is trained as, as to empathize with the patient's problem and then um, obtaining the technical knowledge about the scope and the limitations of these types of prosthetic rehabilitations and also recognize patient limitations, patient motor limitations that many times, if we're talking of patients older than, you know, adults or elderly, or really aged elderly patients, uh, means that we have to train a member of the family to help them with the hygiene and maintenance and pros and denture removal. And if patient, these patients are in homes, uh, the uh, caregivers will have to be trained. So we consider that it is a priority to train 
uh, and educate to obtain a prosthetic solution that is adequate to, re to return functional aesthetics and it's important to incorporate post-installation prevention through periodic controls and maintenance. Uh, the needs and strategies uh, that I mentioned before, uh, let me tell you something what happened to us in the academic environment is that we did not have a protocol for the use, maintenance, and uh, follow-up of the treatments that we treat, uh, we carry out uh, every year or so, together with the um, faculty and in cooperation with GSK, who helped us uh, to, pro to publish this handbook, this um, instructions where we tell the patient what are the limitations of the treatment, we tell them what are the difficulties that they will have in the use uh, or with wearing the denture until neuromuscular adaptation has taken place, the treatment does not start and finish the same day, it takes a pre um, process, there's a process of, of um, application of the treatment and then of adaptation or adjustment of the treatment and so we have this resource which also has something that is very important and that is a guide when the patient is discharged when the patient has gone through the early controls now we are going to or recall them every six months and the patient will be responsible to come back to the uh, place to see the doctor that uh, cared for them and this strategy that we started uh, using uh, this year so we have no results has been most welcome particularly by the students at the university so and this will be the motivation for those speaking after me at the symposium, it would be necessary to strengthen the strategies uh, for improving uh, the wear and maintenance of uh, dentures because it is essential for this kind of patients to understand and take prevention as an important part of the treatment. That is our most uh, important concern so that we can go from this situation where the patient uh, disappears for a long time uh, to one where they can maintain uh, the dentures and the support structures in a good condition because the patient who loses a large number of teeth or even all the teeth is at a disadvantage uh, for wearing a denture which we know has great limitations. I am closing now here and I invite you to continue listening to the speakers and thank you the speakers and thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. We're going to actually hold questions to the end and have a panel session at the end where you can ask uh, any questions that you would like. And many thanks again to Professor Frisia for that excellent roundup of the local situation. As I said earlier on, the piece of work that we've been doing recently over the past few months has been led by Dr. Guy Goffin. Uh, Guy is from Belgium where he held various offices with the Belgian Dental Association as well as being a general practitioner, moved into commerce for many years uh, and now also has uh, an honorary position with King's College in London. He's going to present to us the excellent work that has been done around trying to produce some evidence-based guidelines for optimum denture care and maintenance. Guy. Thank you, Nigel, and thank you for the nice words. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you, the audience, because I know this is break time during the day. You have to go out, chat with your friends, having lunch outside in the sun, in the fresh air, and you came here because you want to learn. And I think that is really appreciated. It's really appreciated because you want to learn, because you want to do better for your patients. You care about your patients. 
you care about the dangers that you make for your patients. And that's the topic that I would like to share with you today, is this global report that we made on evidence-based guidelines for optimal denture care and maintenance. But before that, I would like to share with you and give you the greetings of my country, because I w Nigel told you I'm from Belgium. Yes, that's where I was born, that's where I live, that's where I did practice. But today I'm living in Switzerland. And Switzerland is a very small country somewhere in the middle of Europe. And within that country there is a small town called Geneva. And in Geneva, it sits on the lake of Geneva, we have a landmark, and that's a fountain, a fountain that goes up to 140 meters high. And when I came here, and I'm so pleased to be here now in Argentina, one of the bigger countries, and in Buenos Aires, one of the biggest cities in the world, but with a landmark that is only probably a little bit shorter, but again, it's the same type of landmark. So. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for coming to uh, you for coming to this um, symposium. <clears throat> I will get, for my presentation. I will go to four typical um, uh, session. I will first talk a bit, a little bit about how we came to work these um, uh, guidelines. Then I will briefly touch on the health challenges that we have with wearing dangerous and. Then we will, I will present to you the evidence-based recommendations for optimal dental care. And um, I think you are the first ones to learn about these ones. They are based on a white paper that we produced with the Global Task Force. And that white paper will become available through the All Hand Foundation to all of you. But you are the first ones to learn about these guidelines today. So you are very privileged. And then we end up with a call for action, because what I want is that what you learn today, that you take that home, and that next Monday, when you're back in practice and you see your dental wearing patients, that you bring this to action. As I said, we worked with a global task force for care of full dangers to bring that white paper together and to develop guidelines that are evidence-based, science-based, and that can be used in practice by you practitioners. We had seven very important opinion leaders in prosthodontics in the group. There was Professor David Bartlett that you will hear after me. There will was Nigel Carter, the CEO of the Oral Health Foundation. Professor Emeritus Case de Baat from the University of Nijmegen in Holland. Professor Joke Duik from the University of Leuven in Belgium. Professor Kawai from the University of um, Matsudo Sakaichu Nishi Matsudo in Japan and Professor Frauke Muller uh, from the University of Geneva in Switzerland. It was a privilege to work with these people because they are very knowledgeable about denture care and about uh, prosthodontics in general, and particularly removable prosthodontics. If we think about dentures, then we easily accept to say that dentures are made for people who have lost some of all their teeth. Because dentures help patients improve their appearance, support their lips and cheeks, improve their self-esteem and confidence, and improve their chewing ability, and so help maintain a healthy nutrition. As practitioners, we focus a lot on this particular area of chewing ability. For us, this is what we focus on when we work and we make dangers to our patients. We, we do take care of our patients, but we forget that this is, for them, it's not just about the chewing ability, it's also about appearance. It's also about self-esteem, well-being, confidence, and healthy nutrition. And I would like to ask the audience the first question. I have two questions. First question is, who of you made dangers for patients already? A large group. Now, my second question is, who of you are wearing dentures? Nobody. And I think that's the biggest issue we, where we have when we talk dentures. Because we are talking to our patients without knowing what they feel, what they think, what's going on in their head when they get dentures. And I think that's an approach that we 
definitely have to change in the practice. I'm not asking for you for getting all your teeth extracted and going for dangers, but I would like you to understand exactly well and trying to understand from your patient what the problem is and why he is coming to you. Edentialism, um, luckily on a global basis, it's declining, but it's still highly prevalent. For people over 65 year old, there is still 33% of people who are edentulous around the world. That's a huge group. And as we learned from Dr. Frieza, Dr. Frieza before, this group is growing and will be growing. And then there is the huge discrepancy between the developed countries and the developing countries. It's probably related to social demographic factors, the level of education, access to care, if they have to go from far away to see a dentist or they have a dentist around the corner, uh, if they have learned about how to take care of their natural teeth, and so on and so on. A lot has to do with habits, like, for instance, smoking. There is still a lot of countries where there is a lot of smoking, and it has an impact on edentialism. Health conditions in general, arthritis, asthma, diabetes, all um, health issues that can be related to age and to aging. The oral health challenges, most of you know, of course, the denture-related stomatitis. It is there. Your patients don't know it most of the time. And it can have other uh, implications like candidosis or angular chelitis, also related to a sur infection by candida albicans. These are issues that you can have from wearing dentures. But you, as a dentist, you probably never saw that or felt that yourself. But your patients, they do it. And they hardly tell you because it's not visible, except probably of the angular colitis. The It's not only all health challenges, the health challenges. They are general health challenges. And we easily forget that we as dentists, we work in this small part of the body. But it's the second biggest entrance to the rest of our body. After the skin, the oral cavity is where all the bacteria, everything we eat, we drink, we breathe, is going into your body, passing by the oral cavity, going in the rest of your body. And I think that's where it's easy to understand that an infection or even a sur infection or an overgrowth of probably like bacteria, like probably the Staphylococcus aureus, can lead to nasopharyngeal infection easily. And aspiration, aspiration pneumonia is even an, a more severe uh, risk that people with dentures have. I just learned about a case of an older lady who died from pneumo uh, aspiration pneumonia in an elderly home in Switzerland. And the family afterwards challenged the hospital because this, they said that their family member died because the dangers of the their family member were not cleaned by the nurses or cleaned by the auxiliary people in the elderly home. So I think we have to be aware that we as dental professionals, we have an important task to ensure that these dangers are kept clean. And it's something that we easily forget. We are happy that our patients are happy with our with their fitting dangers and that's it. But we have a role to play to avoid all these problems. Existing guidelines for optimal care. What we did is we looked in, on the internet and looked for in guidelines that were available there. And what we found out is that more than 10% of dental professionals make no primary recommendation on cleaning. And this is a really recent research. But also the guidelines that are published on the internet are very, very variable. They vary tremendously. Just as a couple of examples are put there, the French Dental Association or the Working Group for All Prevention, they recommend to use soap, but not any soap. You had to use the Savon de Marseille, what is a French brand and it's the pride of the French people. So, but there is no whatsoever evidence or any science behind it to make that recommendation. Germany, in Germany, they recommend you to use hand soap, the ones that you find in the bathrooms. In Switzerland, there were some recommendations that I found they made for using dishwashing liquids. Now, you know how dangerous these products are, and these are recommendations that are officially on internet from official dental organizations. 
In the US, they stick still with the baking soda. That's their popular model of cleaning everything. That's also for dangers. And then there's the whole thing about the storage. How do you, would you store your dangers when you take them out? Some say you do it in a glass of water. Other associations say you have to use a danger cleanser in, an, uh, in a glass and then put in the dangers. Others even say you just have to put, make them dry and keep them in a box. Others say keep them in a box but put in a, a wet towel on it. Others just say take them out, put them on the table next to your bed, and that's where they are very well. So very different and across the world. So what we have tried to do now is trying to go from that huge variation and trying to establish guidelines that are somewhere scientifically based and evidence based. Okay, some of the um, guidelines are probably missing, for instance, on storage and everything. You will find all these guidelines on the website as well in the white paper. But I would like to go with you to all four of them very quickly. Just remember, it's about daily cleaning of the dentures with a mechanical action. It's daily soaking in a denture cleansing solution. You should keep your dentures, they should keep their dentures uh, out of the mouth uh, overnight. And all patients, and all patients who wear removable dentures should be enrolled in a regular recall or maintenance program with their dentists. So let's go through all four of them quickly. The first one, daily cleaning. Use a mechanical action. Brush with a toothbrush or a denture brush, nothing else. Use an effective, non-abrasive denture cleanser. Therefore, definitely don't use toothpaste, because most of the toothpaste are far too abrasive. Don't use vinegar, and I've seen a lot of people using vinegar to clean their dentures. Use an effective uh, denture cleanser like the ones that are available on the market, or use a an, an special denture cream that is uh, on the market for cleaning dentures because they have been proven to be safe. Then daily soaking in a denture cleanser solution. We know that the benefits coming from a denture cleaning solution is that it delivers extra chemical breakdown of the remaining plaque. It has some level of disinfection of the denture and also remove stain, stain that can come from drinking too much Malbec or smoking or whatever. But be careful. I think watch out is tell and make sure that your patients understand that these denture cleaning solutions should only be used outside the mouth. And denture wear should follow strictly the manufacturing guidelines that are on the packaging. Make sure that they don't, don't make mistakes. These are elderly people can easily make mistakes Say it not only once, not only twice, but say it several times, please. Dentures wear, wear should not keep their dentures in the mouth overnight. This is something, unless there are specific, specific conditions, but it's a guideline that is even more important for uh, people at a higher risk of developing stomatitis or institutionalized or frail older people. Soaking in a denture cleanser solution seems to be beneficial for preventing stomatitis and the potential risk for a pneumonia events, particularly in this group of people. This has been shown in several researchers, recent researchers that we found uh, in the literature. So definitely keep them out at night. And then L patients should be enrolled in a regular recall and maintenance program. Make sure that your patient understand that once he got his dentures from you, that it's not over. They have to come back, they have to come back to you for regular control, to make sure that you are taking action immediately when it's not clean, when the glitches are not clean, or when there is a need for uh, relining or even making new dentures. Sometimes it still happens that people get their dentures and they eat the, denture, they eat the patients only back after seven or 10 years when they want to have a new denture. Unfortunately, it's like that. So this is the, and sorry for a little bit, the, the callers are not 100%, but there is an infographic that is also available on the, all, on the website of the Whole Health Foundation that says clearly the four, clear, the four uh, messages that I want to convey to you today. Brush your dentures daily, soak your dentures daily, leave your dentures out at night, and visit your dentist regularly. This is the key messages that should be in your memory as from now, and you should never forget them anymore. 
all these details about the, what's in the white paper you can find on this website. But I was told this morning that because you get uh, your batches were scanned when you came in, you will all get an email in the coming days or weeks uh, through GSK with a link to this website where you can pick up all the details from what I just presented. Also, the infographic will be there that you can use with your patients and guide yourself in your uh, communication toward the patients. Finally, I would like to briefly touch on an, a methodology that can help you to bring that message to life with your patients, and that's motivational interviewing. It sounds a very uh, difficult word and everything, but it's very, it consists of really only very six clear, very steps. First, memory. Make sure that you have people, your patients, memorize very well what the four steps are. Try to motivate them. Make them feeling uh, that they have to do something themselves. And give them the feeling of what the perception will be after they have taken care, when they are taking care of their dangers. Make them being attentive to do it daily, that they cannot forget. And please, teach them. L help them learning to how to do it. It's not a big deal. It only takes a couple of minutes. And make them, at the end, commit to some action. Let's go through it quickly. Um, four steps to optimal care. Mechanical cleaning, soak, take out overnight, and roll in a program. Point. That's it. Please tell the patient that's what you have to do. And it's easy, but repeat it all the time so he understands. Motivate them. They are paying for your dangers. They the dangers. They want to keep them in good condition because they have a life with their dangers. So make sure that they are motivated to take care of these dangers that they just got from you. Make sure that they understand that they can live the, at the fullest with their dangers, that they can smile, that they are, can be happy, and they should be happy with their dangers. Not only because of their looking good, but the way of their social interaction, the way that they behave in social life now much more than the elderly people did uh, 40 or 50 years ago. And at the end, you will be a happy dentist as well, coming from that one. Call for action, make, it, make them attentive. Repeat it every time again. It's a daily action. Like when they had their natural teeth, they had to clean their teeth. They have to take action daily, and they have to take the action. It's not you. You're not going with them at home to clean their dangers. They have to do it. So make clear that they have a role to play here and an important role. Call for action, learning. Teach them how to do it. Take their dentures, take a brush, and show how they can take off the denture plaque from the denture. Make sure that they know how to put a tablet in a glass of water. Because these people coming, they have never had that before. For them, it's different. Make sure that they understand that they have to, to put it overnight in a humid condition and take out, and that they have to come back in six months, a year. It's up to you to decide. And at the end, it's almost like signing a contract between you and the patient to make sure that they understand that we have a deal here. You're going to take off the dentures. I made nice dentures. I want to see you back in, in a, month, a year or whatever. And I want to see you being a happy patient and that you will make me a happy dentist. At the end, the achievement for you and your patients will be happiness, alegria. The people will look with a broader smile to the world. They can act socially like they want and they feel good and they will smile. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Guy, for that uh, excellent presentation on the guidelines that uh, we've been working on and have developed. Uh, just to say also, as Guy said, you will be getting the link to the guidelines, but these are also uh, in Spanish and the infographic is also in Spanish and we'll be moving into other languages uh, as well. We've just been talking uh, this afternoon about moving into Portuguese. On now to our third presenter, Professor David Bartlett. Um, he is Head of Prosthodontics at King's College London, uh, very widely renowned and works with many of the international uh, bodies on prosthodontics, very widely published also. And he's going to talk to us on clinical considerations 
and the patient impact of maintaining denture performance. David, over to you. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you, GSK, for sponsoring this event, uh, and thank you for staying. My first trip to Argentina. Uh, I arrived this morning at 8 o'clock, so I haven't seen much yet, but uh, you've got a real problem with traffic, um, but a very pretty city. I come from London, King's College London. Um, my office is the Shard, next to the Shard, that brown building. Uh, that's my office, 25th floor, prosthodontics. We have 150 dental students a year. I don't deliver, but my department delivers 1,500 dentures per year to patients. And most of our students deliver about nine dentures over the course of the five years. So we have quite a lot of dentures to deliver. How often do you ask your dent patients, do they want dentures? How, how often have you thought what it's like to have a lump of plastic in your mouth? Every time you eat, it moves. Every time you speak, your lower complete denture moves. They've had to accept, as they've got older, they've lost their teeth. I've had to accept I've lost my hair. But to lose your teeth. So we must remember the patient, how important it is for them to understand what it's like. How would you feel about taking your teeth out at night? How many of your patients have ever admitted that they've done that? Would you like to have food trapped under the denture? How does that impact their diet? What can they eat? Can you eat an apple? So we've got to recognize the limits of conventional dentures. As a dentist, you have a responsibility to provide high quality clinical stages, which we will describe. The most important part of that journey is a high quality impression, which I'll share with you. Now, the first time you ever fitted a denture, you hand the patient the set of dentures and you're praying they'll smile. More importantly, the week later when you come to review it, the first question you ever ask is have they worn or used the dentures? How many have said no? Have you ever thought about saying at the same time, how about using an adhesive or a fixture? It's not a reflection that you've done bad dentistry, it's reality. If that improves that patient's perception and use of that denture, that's a good thing. I think we need sound with this, guys. Have we got sound? Maybe not. Well, what's he saying is he didn't like the fact that he thinks he's around about 40 years old and he's lost some teeth. Doesn't matter. What we as dentists do is we fixate on the technical procedure. Can you remember the first time you took an impression? You were petrified. You didn't know which side to stand on the patient. You weren't sure where that tray was going. And you were hoping you didn't kill them by suffocating them. As you've improved and your experience has proved, the quality of those dentures hopefully has improved. But the fit of those dentures when you first place in the mouth can be pretty good. But a year or so later, is it the same fit? That's where fixatives can help. Because how many of your patients can afford implants? Not many. 
So the clinical problem. What is the support and the anatomy of the upper denture like? Is it good? Normally in the upper jaw we're okay. We've got the maxilla, we've got the palatal area, and then the result of that is you get reasonable stability, retention, and support of a denture. We struggle with it lower. How many times have you fitted a denture? And then a year later, ask them, are they wearing the lower denture? And they're not. So the first thing is you need a good quality impression. Spend time getting rolled borders. Spend time to make sure you get the buckle shelf, the lingual extensions, the retromolar pads, maxillary tuberosity. Because if you do mess around with your primary impression and you don't get it right, then everything later on becomes a problem. We use a technique of using a putty impression, and over that, we use an alternate wash. And that creates a good quality primary impression. And in the lower jaw, the same. Putty, which acts as almost as a special tray, and then you place your alternate over that to give the best quality impression for the secondary impression which is to follow. Because if you come to your secondary impression and you don't get it looking like that, then the quality of that, that denture later on will be compromised. It's really important to get a good, high quality secondary impression. It doesn't really matter what material you use. Some use alginate. Some use a silicone, some use ibrogan. Provided you get the shape right, that's what you're trying to achieve. It's the lower jaw which is harder. Try and get a buckle shelf rather than a tube, which I call the British tube, without any anatomy in it on at all and just goes in their mouth. Try and get some shape into that denture to give that patient the best quality that they can achieve. So when you come to do your wax, where your occlusal rims, some will do it in wax, some will process acrylic to give a little bit more retention for those rims. It's more expensive but actually it will give you significant benefit when trying to record the occlusion if you've got a stable base. Because that's an important stage. How many of you are teachers doing that uh, in prosthodontics? That bird isn't. If you've ever been in charge of five to eight students all doing this stage. It is the most horrific half an hour, an hour of your time that you'll ever do, because they can all get it wrong. And I can remember one year I brushed the dentures and then a few months later, the patient came in. I'd got the occlusal vertical dimension wrong and they looked as if they were part of the horse race at Ascot. Ascot. Everything was wrong. Because dentures move. Every time you eat, they move. Every time they eat food, they move. So we're trying to get the best out of the dentures that we can do. So we do need to rely on the technicalities of that denture and our stages to provide the denture at the end of the day. But we mustn't forget the patient who's terrified, absolutely terrified of being in that chair with you. They were terrified because they've lost all their teeth. Why have they lost their teeth? They've had poor oral hygiene and they've been terrified of dentures, dentists. Outcome is you haven't got the best patient cohort to deal with. 
Don't be frightened of recommending denture fixatives. They can significantly help. What they won't overcome is a poorly made denture, but if the denture has got a reasonable fit, they will maximize the retention of that denture, reduce the food accumulation, improve confidence in public, and potentially give them the opportunity to eat healthier food. Don't use too much. Visit the GSK scan stand. There's a guy there teaching you how much to use. The temptation is to dump a load of this stuff on the denture. But actually it only needs a small pea size amount in three areas to give you the maximum outcome. Don't use it with poor dentures because it won't help. It can be effective with immediate dentures, but there's a time limit on that as the tissues resolve. Because a denture will improve the strength of the bite. It will reduce the amount of food under that denture. And it can improve their diet. This is a study we did five or six years ago on 35 patients at King's. All had their dentures less than a year, me in age of 74, and we looked at their diet before and after giving them a fixative. And we recorded the amount of bread, toast, crackers, vegetables, fruit, crisps, cheese, and other food before and after the fixative. And the yellow line is the fixative, and the no fixative is the blue line. And it improved their confidence. It reduced their pain. It meant more to them. They didn't think they were so phys had so much physical disability. And overall, it was about 50% perception improvement on that denture. But strikingly, they all doubled the amount of fruit and vegetables they consumed within that 30 days. Reduced the amount of fat, reduced the amount of saturated fat, and improved their vitamin C. So not only can you potentially look to have a better fitting denture, the possibility occurs that you might have a better diet. So it's worth thinking about using a denture fixative or adhesive with a good quality denture because it might improve the consumption of healthy eating. But they cannot overcome a poor denture. They can improve the wearing of that denture, improve the patient's confidence. But if they do use it, it's not a reflection on failure your behalf is part of the overall care. So we really need to think from the patient's perspective about their experience with dentures. None of us. Guy asked the question. Nobody in this room has any clue personally about wearing dentures. I hope none of us ever do. But it is worth thinking what they're thinking, what that patient is feeling. They don't want to have dentures, but they have no choice. Anything that we can do to improve their experience and improve their journey through life has got to be a good thing. So what are we doing next? We've had the consensus group talking about denture cleansers, we're now starting on what to do with denture fixatives and adhesives. Again, to help you understand when and how to apply it. Were you ever taught how to apply them in dental school? Ever shown? I suspect if you've ever done it, you pour half the tube on the denture and chuck it in the patient's mouth. It's the wrong way. You actually want small amounts. We want that patient-centered approach. 
our patients, and we understand what they're going through. And we need to know how to communicate with patients for them to get the best out of the dentures, because none of us ever want to wear them. But we need to understand, from the patient's perspective, what happens to them and improve their quality of life. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. And I'd like to invite the three speakers to join me here on the days, and uh, we'll then open the floor to questions. So we've, we've heard three excellent presentations and thought-provoking presentations in a, an area that uh, I think is very neglected within dentistry. Do we have any questions for the, uh, for the speakers? Um, we have microphones either side, if you could do that because it is being recorded. Yeah, please. Three lectures were very good, very excellent, and I think it is what we, the dentists, as well as the patient, need to do. But the thing is that the denture care products are very expensive for these elderly poor people. Many cannot afford in developing countries. Can the uh, Oral Health Foundation in the UK do something for this to make these pro uh, products cheaper, easily available to these poor patients? It's not something that we can particularly do, but I think it's something that the companies maybe need to take on board in terms of the um, the fact that it is that population. Most of these that products are them. actually can, uh, taxed. In so if the respective governments make these product tax free, then it will be easy, easily available and become cheaper for them. I think potentially an excellent idea. Yeah. That works. Um, it's a difficult, isn't it? Yeah, it is because difficult. dentures are worn by the poorer of society. Um, and ideally, everybody, if they lose their teeth, should have implants. But there's no way that will ever happen in anybody's lifetime. Um, but we can't control cost of products. None of us are commercial. Um, but if if it improves quality of life for a patient, then maybe it's worth that purchase. Uh, but only they can make that decision. Just like I have the conversation with the patients if they want implants. And a friend of mine used to say that you can get a small car, a Mini, or you can have a Rolls Royce. They both get you to the same destination, where the Rolls Royce is a bit more comfortable. I I forgot, my I forgot my introduction. I got trained with uh, Dr. Leichman, John Hopkins, oh, right. and Professor Angus Wall. So all my teachers are sitting here, so I'm very proud of you people. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Angus, are you heading towards the microphone? <laughs> excuse, excuse the hop-along approach. Um, David, thank you for raising function as a component of denture wear. Um, and it was interesting to see your data about change in diet, because most of the world literature suggests that unless you encourage patients to change their diet at some stage in the process of denture manufacture, you don't see a change in diet. They think they can chew better, but they don't change what they go out to buy. And so I would uh, encourage colleagues in the audience to think in terms not only of allowing people or facilitating their, their denture care and maintenance, but also challenging them to try to eat those things that previously they found more difficult, particularly in association with the use of a fixed tip to provide greater stability or board a seal, 
etc. Thank you, Angus. Um, for those who don't know, Angus did a lot of work in this area with colleagues from Newcastle. And it is important. And I was very fortunate because I had a very single objective, which I'd been paid the grant to try and make it work. But it took an awful lot of work talking to the patients. And it's raising their confidence in those dentures. And if you raise their confidence and their understanding, they will use and have a better diet because it is really important, particularly in that group of people who end up with having to wear dentures. So the diet is part of that story. And as dental care professionals, we have that responsibility to try and help that patient through that process. It's something that we forget. We're more interested in delivering a technical bit of work rather than thinking of what the patient is at the other, other end. We must never between the primary impression and the second impression, do you place any kind of adhesive to take the impression? Do you use any kind of adhesive between the first, the primary and secondary impression? For the primary impression with the silicone putty, yes, we use an adhesive on the tray. But actually, then, if you do the alginate wash over it, you don't need an adhesive. It sticks to it. It's a really good technique. It does over-contour the impression because it just makes it a bit big. But you get a very good border outlines, and it can overcome and help students in their first impression. And it's a really good technique. And you'll get better lingual extensions and buccal areas as well. So when you come to do your secondary impression, you've actually got a good starter from your primary. It really is a neat technique. Gracias. Thank you. I've got one, because uh, I'm getting very old, and I was of the generation that we were taught that it was failure to recommend a denture fixative. Um, at what point in time did that change and fixatives become more acceptable? That's a very interesting question. I think at the end of the day, many patients go to the chemist themselves without ever asking a dentist whether or not they should or should not use an adhesive. And it's not dissimilar to sensitive toothpaste where the majority of that journey is done by the patient. But in dental schools, it's still a focus on getting the product out and forgetting about the patient at the end of it. We've introduced it. We've tried to get people to use denture fixatives when they need it. Um, at what time, on an individual basis, I think that's up to the patient. But I think as dentists, we should encourage it and use it as part of the overall care and not be frightened. Uh, thank you, David. Any, sorry, David. I just want to add to that. I don't, uh, because I asked earlier if you were wearing dentures, you, you did and nobody did. But it's like if you ever walked around with a little stone in your shoe and you, how you feel, and that's about the whole food trapping that these denture wearing people are confronted with every time again after when they eat, when they get something food. They have the same feeling that you have when you walk around with a little stone in your, food, in your uh, shoes, between your sock and your shoes. I see no more questions, so I'd like to thank all our speakers uh, for the excellent presentations that they've given uh, this afternoon. Thank you all very much indeed. And most of all, thanks to you in our audience for attending and sticking with us through your lunch times. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>